Hi everybody, um, I am Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I'm also certified in culinary medicine. I am the creator and founder of The Paused Life and The Galveston Diet. So I love coming on, I haven't been able to come on in a while and doing Q and A's live with my followers. Um, to answer your questions about menopause and women's health. So if you are here, give me a um, tap on my face like this to give me some likes. It'll help drive the algorithm. And if you have any questions, just drop them um, in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them for you. So I don't know how many of you know, but I am currently writing a second book. The first book was The Galveston Diet, which is a nutrition and wellness kind of um, blueprint for menopause. Um, but I've just gotten so many more questions about menopause in general, about hormone replacement therapy, about some of the uncommon signs and symptoms of menopause that I have decided to write another book to answer those questions. It is titled The New um, menopause and should be out next May. It takes a long time to do all the research and write these books. but. In the meantime, um, I would love to answer your questions, so drop them in the comments below. Um, anything to do with menopause that I can possibly answer. Now, I can't. Don't give me your personal medical information. These are just questions in general. I can't be your doctor on the internet. I would lose my malpractice insurance. And feel free to share this video with a friend. You can click the share button. And um, Okay, you are in need of making an appointment. I do see patients uh, in Texas. So I am licensed to practice medicine in the states of Texas and Colorado. And, oh, belly fat help, I'll get to that in a second. Um, if you go to the link in my bio up here, um, this will take you to where you can find out how to make an appointment and all of the free and wonderful um, information that is available on our website. So, okay, belly fat help. Great question, great question. You know, I have actually been doing a deep dive into the uh, pathophysiology of why, as a gender, we are gaining more visceral and abdominal fat through the menopause transition than we ever did in our lives before. And here's what I can tell you. It's not your fault, okay? It is not your fault. It is completely hormonal. Um, there are so if you've changed nothing about your diet and exercise, okay, other than you getting older, aging does have something to do with it, but much more importantly, when we take aging out of the equation, when the studies were done, the cascade of hormonal changes that are happening to us through the menopause transition is a huge cofactor, huge, in why we are gaining visceral and abdominal fat, and that starts off. So basically what happens is as our estrogen levels decline, our inflammation levels go up, okay? Our markers of inflammation go up and that increasing inflammation is also going up somewhat with age, but just take age out of the equation. Just the loss of estrogen dramatically starts increasing our inflammation markers, which leads to increasing risk of insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease, belly fat, abdominal accumulation. So when we talk about fat accumulation in the female body, we have subcutaneous fat, which is the fat you have known your whole life, okay? It gives us curves, it gives us cellulite. We don't like it, it's cosmetically distressing, but it's not really that metabolically dangerous. Visceral and abdominal fat, which is the fat underneath, the, you know, underneath the abdomen that goes inside and wraps around our organs is a completely different type of fat. And one that when we're younger, we really don't have a lot of. Um, and then as we go through menopause, suddenly you're having this increase in your abdominal abdominal expansion. And this fat is metabolically dangerous. It is pro-inflammatory. It creates cytokines, which are inflammatory um, markers in the blood. And it, it leads to um, increasing insulin resistance. It gets you in this entire negative feedback cycle. So what can you do about it? What can you do about it? So um, 
from a nutritional standpoint, I've done a lot of deep dives here, and we cover this in the Galveston Diet, um, there are definite things that you can do nutritionally that have been proven in women, the women who do this consistently, okay, will have decreasing abdominal fat. So one is women who consistently get above 25 grams of fiber in their diet per day will have less visceral and abdominal fat or belly fat, as we call it in medicine or in lay terms. So what does that look like? Most women are getting, uh, most females are only getting about 12 grams of fiber in their diet per day. And when you can bump that up to 25 grams per day, consistently you will see a lot of changes happening in your body. One, fat, fiber slows the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream, which lowers your insulin levels, okay? Two, people who have more fiber in their diet have less insulin resistance. Three, it feeds the gut microbiome. Uh, soluble fiber is the food for our gut microbiome, keeps them happy and healthy. And so if you have not had that much fiber in your diet per day, this is something you need to ease into. I would not go from 12 to 25 overnight. You will be gassy, bloated, distended. Oh, thank you for the heart, guys. Thank you for all the gifts and the hearts and the likes and the shares. It really helps drive the algorithm and keeps me relevant on this platform, which is kind of hard for a 55, almost 55-year-old. <laughs> obstetrician gynecologist who cares about menopause so but thank you keep tapping my face for the likes thank you thank you thank you <laughs> um, that's so cute if you keep tapping it will drive the likes and will increase the visibility so let's get back to visceral fat so one is 25 grams of fiber per day but buyer beware you need to increase that slowly over about two to three weeks or you will be very uncomfortable gassy bloated distended that will end but you can lessen the discomfort if you go slow and allow your gut microbiome a chance to adjust number two is less than 25 grams of added sugars per day. Sugars added in cooking and processing, okay? Not in fruits and vegetables. So the keto movement, you know, people were losing weight, yes, we all know that, but at a tremendous cost. One, it tends to be not sustainable. Two, you're not getting micronutrients, you're not getting fiber, you're not getting all the things that we're supposed to be eating that keep us healthy. It's a very pro-inflammatory nutrition program for a lot of people, the way that traditional keto is done. And with the keto movement, people People were to stop eating all carb carbohydrates, even the healthy complex ones. So when you look at sugars in terms of what God put in the food versus what is added to the food, if you limit your added sugars, including alcohol, to less than 25 grams per day, those women who do that in the perimenopause, menopause status do much better with inflammation and with visceral fat. Okay, so I'm not saying you can never have a cookie or never have something, you know, that's a treat, but, but consistently lowering the, limiting those added sugars to 25 grams per day is gonna do your body a lot better, okay? Number three, a diet rich in probiotics. Women who, there was a couple of studies done on menopausal women who were obese with hypertension, and they gave half of the women placebo and the other half a probiotic supplement. And they found that and a low calorie diet. Okay, you know, they restricted their calories. Both groups lost weight. However, the women who were taking the probiotic had decreasing abdominal fat much more than the other group. So the other group was losing more muscle and less fat and the, the probiotic group was actually hanging on to more muscle and losing more visceral and abdominal fat and their blood pressure got better. And so, and you know, my, my nutrition professors will be like, look, you should really source all of your nutrients from food if you can. So if you're eating something rich in probiotics every day, if you are, drop it in the comments. So that could be yogurt, kimchi, kombucha, miso. Let me see in the comments what your favorite source of probiotic rich foods are. And so, or do a probiotic supplement. Now, I do take a probiotic supplement. I get mine from um, Garden of Life, and I'm traveling right now, so I use the one that is encapsulated, so the freeze-dried version. It's better for travel for me. When I'm home, I tend to do the refrigerated kind. So I do the women's 85 billion or 50 billion, depending on which, and so you wanna do one that has billions and billions of cultures, because you lose a lot in the uh, digestive process and so you and I you know this is unsponsored I don't get paid to talk about probiotics um, now if you're if I'm eating yogurt that day I don't take a probiotic supplement because I'm getting it from my food 
Okay, number three is exercise, guys, both cardiovascular and strength training. Cardiovascular in zone two, um, which is just per perceived uh, exertion is just, um, just below breathless. You can talk through it, but you don't want to, okay? Um, now, there are online calculators to figure out your zone two. I use my tracking watch that tracks my pulse and my ring to be able to tell me what my max and min heart rate are so that I can get a really nice um, estimation of what my zone two is without having to go on an oxygen monitor and all that. So I try to do 150 minutes a week in zone two. So for me, that's walking on a treadmill, um, on an incline here in the mountains, when I'm spending time in the mountains, I just walk outside. <laughs> and so um, it really makes a big difference. Um, okay, and so um, thank you for the likes, guys, the likes and the shares. Um, so those are some keys there. So keep dropping your questions in the comments. Uh, let's see. What are your thoughts on taking estrogen and progesterone with menopause? Hi, you must be new here. I am a huge fan of hormone replacement therapy in menopause. Now remember, when a physician, when an obstetrician gynecologist talks about hormone replacement therapy, she is talking about estrogen, giving your body back the estrogen your ovaries are no longer making, preferably in the form of estradiol, which is what your ovaries used to make. We add in progesterone for specific reasons. If you still have a uterus, we must must protect the lining of the uterus from endometrial hyperplasia and cancer from unopposed estrogen, so we give you progesterone for that. In other cases, progesterone can be helpful for sleep and be helpful for anxiety. So if I have a patient who's had a hysterectomy or has a Mirena IUD, you know, doesn't need the progesterone to protect the lining of her uterus, but she's, she's doing well, but still struggling a bit with sleep and anxiety, I will add back in progesterone in the form of oral micronized progesterone for that. Um, now, this is a, a big thing I'm researching for the book. A lot of you are being told that you are not candidates for hormone replacement therapy. How many of you, let me, give me some likes. Let me see. If, have you been told you can't take it, you can't take hormone therapy? Have you been told this? Let me see. Press, 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 press on my face. Um, have you been told this? Yes, yes, yes. Now let me see why have you been told this? Because I'm going to dispel a lot of myths and rumors and misunderstanding, even in the medical community, around women who are not candidate, who have been told they're not candidates for hormone replacement therapy. Okay. First of all, Amy, there is no increased risk of cancer if done correctly. Okay, if done safely, there is not an increased risk of cancer. That is a misconception. That is the greatest failing of health in the world was the overblown. Yes, you can get you can get endometrial cancer if you don't take hormone replacement therapy safely. But the risk of breast cancer was dramatically overblown. Okay? Who knows what the increased risk of breast cancer is with hormone replacement therapy? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? Okay. Um, can you tell me what the, what the percentage increased risk is? What, you know, how many women out of a thousand, out of a thousand per year will get, you know, breast cancer on estrogen only? How many? It is zero. On estrogen alone, women versus placebo, there was no increased risk of breast cancer. On estrogen plus progesterone in the WHI study, that went from four out of a thousand women, baseline, baseline, okay, to five out of a thousand women. One out of a thousand women per year. That's it. That's it on estrogen plus progesterone. And that was only on medroxyprogesterone acetate. When you look at the studies that were looking at other forms of progesterone, such as oral micronized progesterone, no increased risk, none, okay? Estrogen might feed a breast cancer, but it doesn't cause a breast cancer. If estrogen caused breast cancer, we would get breast cancer in pregnancy routinely, okay? Our estrogen levels will, unless you're taking some massive dose, they will never be higher than they were in pregnancy. And pregnancy-related breast cancers are very, very rare. Very rare, okay? Okay, so um, who else has been told they can't take hormone replacement therapy, okay? Who else? Um, who else has been told? Let me, let me look at the comments here. Um... 
because your dad has a blood clot in his leg and he's 87. Okay, so if you have factor five family history of blood clots, even if you've had a blood clot, you were still a candidate for hormone replacement therapy in the form of transdermal, okay? Transdermal is much, 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 much safer. When we take oral estrogen, any of you on oral estrogen should go back and ask your doctor for transdermal. It is much safer. It is much safer as far as inflammatory profile. It is much safe. There's zero increase of blood clots, zero, zero. No increased risk of blood clots over your baseline, okay? Now, because your dad had a blood clot or your family has a blood clot or you have factor V Leiden, that is a risk of, that is an inherent risk of, of blood clots. We will not increase that risk. Will not with hormone replacement therapy. Same as migraine with aura. Same. Transdermal does not increase the risk of a stroke. Does not. Only oral. So, only oral. Does HRT help with weight loss if you're doing the work? Potentially. It's more, less to do with weight. Remember, you guys, are, what do you say? What do you mean when you mean weight loss? Okay. Stop thinking of weight loss as the number on the scale. Think about fat loss. Okay. For those of you who are losing weight on calorically restrictive diets, half of what you're losing is muscle and that's making you less healthy in the long run and more likely to rebound. So, Hormone replacement therapy is helpful for fat loss, not muscle loss, okay? It's helpful for fat loss, especially in the intra-abdominal cavity. Now, taking HRT is not a magical panacea. You can't keep doing what you're doing and expect to lose weight, okay? It is a multimodal, multifactorial approach. Okay, so, um, all right, I'm reading, 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 reading. Um, what is your opinion on, okay, um, are ba birth control pills hormone replacement therapy? They are considered to be a form of hormone replacement therapy. Yes, they are. Transdermal equals patch or a gel. Okay. Um, okay. Doctor wants you to go on Mirena perimenopausal at 49. So the Mirena can go a long way to helping with menstrual cycle drama. Okay, most of us will have some kind of a menstrual cycle drama. Uh, about 85% of us will have menstrual cycle irregularity, heavy periods, no periods, skipping periods. But a Mirena can be treatment for that. It is not treatment for systemic menopause. It's not going to lower your inflammation levels. It's not going to treat your bone density. It's not going to help your vaginal mucosa. It's not going to help your brain fog. It's not going to help any of those things. It will just help the uterus. So for menstrual cycle is drama with perimenopause, the Mirena is a great option, but you must get estrogen as well to treat your systemic menopause. Um, pros and cons of pellets. I talk about this extensively. Look, we have hormone therapy in the form of estrogen plus or minus progesterone and testosterone is a separate issue. Then we have delivery methods. How are we going to get this into your body? Okay. I'm not a fan of the delivery method of a pellet. I don't like them. Why? One, the people who make them don't reinvest any money into women's health research. And they are a billion dollar company. They are making money off of your backs and it makes me crazy. Number two, it's stuck in your body for three months. I can't adjust it. I can't fix it. If you're not happy with it, whatever. Number three, the company routinely recommends super physiologic dosage. It's in their paperwork. You can look it up. Okay, for both estradiol and for estrogen levels and for testosterone, they routinely recommend transitioning female to male levels for treatment of low testosterone levels. Okay, they routinely recommend baseline doubling what a healthy 25 year old would ever have for a testosterone level, and that bothers the ever living shit out of me, and I think it's unethical. Okay, and that. The, the, the healthcare providers who are pelleting you are buying the stuff wholesale and then up regulating it. So they're personally profiting off of a medication being put in your body. And I just, I, that makes me icky and I don't like it. I can give you, and they're not regulated by any regulatory agency. They're not third party tested. They don't give a shit. They're just trying to sell you a bunch of stuff. They make grandiose claims, which are not backed up by evidence. It's simply a method of getting it in your body. It is not better. It is not safer. It is 
not more efficacious. You may love them. You get to spend whatever money. This is your budget. You don't have to spend that kind of money to get safe, efficacious hormone therapy. That is going to work for you. That is body identical. You don't. Okay. And if your healthcare provider is only offering you pellets, that is a fucking red flag and you should run. Okay. If they're like, no, 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 they're so much better. They're so much safer. Da, da, da. They are healthcare providers. Their job is to give you all of your options and then you decide together what is best for you. And if at the end of that discussion, you decide that pellets are best for you, then God bless you, go for it. But if they are not giving you an unbiased, description of pellets and why they are only insisting on giving you pellets because they're fucking making money off of you. And I can't stand that. Okay. The end. All right. So, um, let's see. What is the age cutoff for HRT? There is no age cutoff for HRT. You can take it till you die. That is your decision. That is shared decision making. I'm not coming off. I'm going to die with my patch on. I'm pretty sure. Uh, unless I develop an absolute contraindication, an absolute contraindication, I will stay on it until I die. It, it's lowering my inflammation markers, decreasing my risk of cardiovascular disease, decreasing my risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. I am absolutely okay with this. Uh, you love your patch, but oral, I would not take oral. I rarely die, you know, oral has benefits, trust me, but only if people absolutely can't do the patch or the gel is when I recommend oral. I'm on a generic estradiol patch, nothing fancy. I can go get it and show it to you. Um, let's see. Um, there are multiple articles published. They are not keeping up with the latest data. If they're just telling you, I don't believe in hormone therapy, I don't do hormone therapy, it's not worth the risk. They are not educated and it's really not their fault. So, um, uh, okay. I'm looking at questions. Ozempic and HRT. You really should be seeing an obesity medicine specialist. If you are on Ozempic, I am work. I work with obesity medicine specialists. These are people who are board certified in obesity medicine. There are so many risk factors associated, you know, it's risk benefit ratio. So you really need someone who's invested. If you're just taking these medications to lose 10 pounds, you really are doing your body a disservice long-term. If you have had lifelong obesity or really struggling with morbid obesity, Ozempic can be a lot. Ozempic and those type of medications can be a lifesaver, but you really need someone who is, is, specialized and focused and I would not go to a med spa and get those medications. It is really, they're really dangerous if not done in the right hands. So I am working with some obesity medicine specialists. I'm handling the nutrition in through the Galveston diet. I'm monitoring their muscle mass through my body in body scanner. So, um, okay. Uh, Let's see, you have perimenopause, now have gingivitis. Yes, so um, uh, right now I'm writing the chapter on dental and oral changes um, with menopause and increasing gingivitis, tooth loss, and burning tongue are three of these classic symptoms of menopause that are not really talked about that much. And so if you are noticing these things, um, we don't know if hormone therapy is going really to help. I mean, there are more studies are needed, but I just want people to know that these are some of the things to, to watch out for. Um, Let's see, do you need your levels tested? No, um, we should be able to diagnose perimenopause based on symptoms alone. There is no blood, urine, or saliva test, save your money. I don't believe in the, you know, there are, there's nothing definitive because the hormone levels are so wildly fluctuating. And people who are trying to convince you to do these $400 urine and saliva tests, guys, save your monies, you don't need it. You just need a practitioner who knows what they're doing. Um, what is the ideal testosterone level? Is 90 too high? So when we look at testosterone levels in a 25-year-old sexually like woo female, the her average level is 45. The high normal, highest normal is 70. Okay. So if I had a woman come to me and she's got like a deep voice and she's, you know, uh, acne or something out of nowhere, and I check a testosterone level, if it's above 90, my job with my background in endocrinology is to look for a tumor. Okay. So those of you who are getting levels of 150, 200, 300 with the pellets, God fucking bless you because that is not medically indicated. There are no data to support that. There are no randomized control studies. Those 250 is 
low male levels, okay? That is the starting level for a healthy male is 250, okay? So I would never do that to a woman, never, unless she was transitioning from female to male. And if you want to do that, that is totally up to you, but I don't have the expertise in that. That is not my, that is not my jam. Um, so, uh, I'm reading the questions. I don't know what GI mapping is guys. That is not a thing. Um, on estra test, uh, for over a year, your T level is four. You must not be in the U S estra test got taken off the market in the United States. Um, let's see. So for my patients, we, there are a couple of options when I diagnose, when I prescribe testosterone. One is you just give them the male version, which is T-STEM, but it's, it's hard to titrate. Uh, that T-STEM box, um, we need 10% of a male's dose typically. So that box will last 10 times longer for a male. So at least six months, the box of, you know, and you have to pay for it out of pocket because it's not covered by insurance. It's not indicated for females because, you know, FDA is not perfect, it's better than nothing, but they have not approved it. For women, so there's T-STEM versus compounding. So I usually have it compounded for my patients at a very low level. Um, I use five milligrams per uh, milliliter and we give them about five milligrams per day. And so that, t you know, and then we, um, that keeps them out of the toxic range and into the normal physiologic therapeutic range. Like my level is about 51 right now. Um, using that level, using that compounded, I do a compounded cream for myself. So, um, uh, is combi patch safe? Combi patch is pretty safe. I'm, um, let's see. Uh, just, for breast cancer, the combi patch has, um, hang on one second. Combi patch, I switched from combi patch to the estradiol patch and oral micronized progesterone because of the very slight increase in safety for breast cancer versus the combi patch versus the, the, the testosterone, I mean, the progestin that's in the combi patch, which is synthetic. And so, um, so I take oral micronized progesterone. It's a lot less convenient, but it does work for me. Um, let's see. Uh, opinion on estrogen. Trochies. I don't know anything about trochies. I prefer a cream. I just think trochies would be hard to... Ugh. It is transmucosal, not oral. So it's safer than oral. You never, ever, 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 no one ever wants to take oral um, testosterone, again, just like oral estrogen, it goes to the liver and can lead to some cholesterol issues. Um, whereas estrogen can lead to blood clotting issues. So that, for that reason, we don't, we try to not prescribe oral estrogen or testosterone. So trochies are transmucosa through the mucosa of the mouth. Um, so I am on a generic estradiol patch. That's what I take. Um, okay, so big news from Galveston Diet. For those of you who are Galveston Diet fans, you know, we've had the book out. We have our supplements out. We all now have a meal delivery service. So it is in the link in bio at Dr. Mary Claire if you want to go check it out. We have a code. Somebody write this down. It's TGD15 to save $15 on your first order. If you guys are curious and want to go try it, they are gluten-free, dairy-free, they are anti-inflammatory and they are delicious. <laughs> they are, because we use local kitchens and have chefs prepare the meals, they're not available everywhere yet. You can get on the waiting list um, when it opens up in your area. It does go to most big metropolitan areas, but if you're in a rural area, it may not be deliverable to you. We're very, very picky on quality and on, um, so it's TGD 15 to save uh 15 the cruise stay tuned we are having a menopause retreat which is a cruise coming up the dates are january 27th through february 1st the cruise is out of galveston we will be announcing it soon we have gently announced it to our um, vip members and we have several that have signed up we have 50 cabins available and we have multiple experts coming in menopause and orthopedic surgery and mu muscle and joint pain and cancer research that it's going to be a blast. I cannot wait. And, um, we chose a cruise because there are multiple options. I didn't So one of my friends is doing like a menopause conference at Canyon ranch. Look, I, 
I'm never going to be that girl. I'm never going to like for people to come and learn and talk to me, charge five, ten thousand dollars. You can get on the cruise and share a cabin for about seven, eight hundred bucks. You know, I know that's still cost prohibitive for a lot of people, but we were trying to keep the cost down. Cruises aren't for everyone. I totally get that. Um, don't come. Don't come. We will have other conferences that will be on land. <laughs> but this was just something we got inspired to do because the cruises come to Galveston. That's where I live. We were trying to make it easy for my team. And it is January 27th through February 1st out of Galveston. So stay tuned for the big announcement for that. The cabins will go quickly. We are, we're starting, you know, they are selling right now. And um, uh, it's Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean. Uh, so, um, and the cost of the cruise will include, you know, through our website, will include the registration for the conference. So, um, it's going to be a blast, guys. I can't wait. And I'll be there. I'll be talking to you. We're all going to have our, like, meal stuff together, like our dining um, tables will all be in the same area. So, I'll be able to hop around from table to table and come visit. And you guys will have the conference. You know, we'll have two days at sea where we're going to be doing lectures for you guys. And it'll be awesome. Um, okay. So, how do you get estrogen patch? You're on the Cream Now Bioidentical. So, creams are compounded. They're okay, but I, I prefer to do uh, FDA approved options. So, the cream, the patches are a prescription. You can get them from your healthcare provider. If they prescribe you a cream, they can prescribe you a patch. And the patches, if you shop around with um, GoodRx, are about 20, 25 bucks a month. So, yeah. Um, why no pellets? I think you have better options. A pellet is just a delivery service to get, you know, a delivery, a mode of delivery, um, to get it into your body. And I don't like something stuck there for three months. I don't like that they're not regulated. I don't like that they're not third party tested. I don't like that they routinely recommend super physiologic doses, which are toxic. I don't recommend that doctors are only offering pellets and nothing else. Um, and so, um, what is the visit like at my office? Um, look, FDA approved means shit, LOL. You know, it's better than nothing. Look, you're a cowgirl. You do you. You don't give a shit about the FDA, then, then God bless you. I don't think the FDA is perfect. They piss me off because they won't do a lot of stuff for women. But I know that when their little testers or PhDs go in there and test shit that they say is in the medicine, that it's actually in it. Okay. Now as far, so that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the FDA is giving their blessing. I don't give a shit about that. I want to know that what is in that box is what they say. And there's a 93% chance that what they say is in that prescription is not. Guess what? You go to a compounder, you go to the pellet people, it's a 37% chance that what is in that tablet is not in it or in that pellet. That's the difference. And that's what I'm talking about. I don't think the FDA is perfect. I don't, I think they need to get their shit together and be nicer to women and give us more options on medications. But so that's it. Uh, I don't do telehealth. I don't have to, I have 260 people on a waiting list to come see me in person. And I have a lot of equipment in my office that I can offer patients that I can't do through telehealth and telemedicine. There's my husband. How was your bike private? Fabulous. Who are we talking to? Ah, oh, the world. Hi. So, um... I'm gonna make some eggs. You hungry? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Bacon? Yes. Always bacon. <laughs> um, let's see. I practice in Texas, so I practice... So if you go to the uh, link in bio here, you can find... Scroll down to the bottom um, for an in-person visit. You can find that there. Oh, this is from Gap Fit. Gap fit. It's a, you know, ribbed workout tank uh, with a built in little bra thingy. Um, I don't think I can walk today. I'm still not feeling great. Oh, no I just shit. got up to go change and I got lightheaded. What I've been sick. Eight, and I'm better. I'm much better, but I'm not totally well, go down and get some wine. recovered. Oh my God. No. Um, let's see. Your flight attendant. Oh, bless your heart. That's a hard life. THBSO at 29, now 51. Is estradiol at 0.3075 and up? Maybe. So we, there are no, we dose 
estradiol based on your symptoms, based on how you're feeling. We don't have arbitrary levels yet. No one's done that work to say you want to be at this level in order to get health benefits. Remember, when we're talking about hormone replacement therapy in the form of estrogen, we have symptom control, right? Hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, da, da, da. And then we have the cardiovascular, neurodegenerative, inflama inflammation, visceral fat benefits. So all we know right now, based on the current evidence and data, is that women who are on HRT starting younger, for whatever reason they go on, okay, regardless of what level they're on, if they simply take it, they have lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower inflammatory markers, no, and this is in transdermal, not oral, okay, and lower risk of neurodegenerative disease. So... Um, so that's all we know. We don't know that if you were in 0.375 versus 0 0.75, if there is going to be a difference. We don't know that data yet. Uh, menopause lasts the rest of your life. Remember, we have symptoms of menopause, which, which might be limited. And then we have the, the cardiovascular health and medical, you know, um, the pro-inflammatory state, basically, that starts at menopause. And that goes on forever, unless you're on hormone replacement therapy. So... Um, Oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, so I invite you, if you like what I'm saying, I invite you to follow me. You can follow me by clicking one of these buttons down here. Um, and um, what do you think about HRT and libido? Okay, that's a great question. Do y'all want to talk about libido? We can talk a little bit about libido. Um, and thank you. So everyone, take a second. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I'm also a culinary medicine specialist. So I'm the creator and founder of the Pause Life and the Galveston Diet. I do all things menopause. I, I work on menopause um, education. Um, I get paid through my clinic, you know, just full disclosure. I also have a few supplements that I sell through the Galveston diet. I also have the book, the Galveston diet and our online program. Um, we now have Galveston diet meals, which are developed for menopause and they're very, very anti-inflammatory. You can check all of that out at our link up here. The Galveston diet meals are, we have a special right now, TGD 15, TGD, the Galveston diet one five for $15 off your first order. If you want to go check that out. Um, okay, so libido. Um, libido is a non-medical term, and it is, um, I need to go get my charger. Hang on. It's a non-medical term. So when we talk about female sexual dysfunction, which is a more um, proper way to say it, basically a woman comes to my office and says, I'm not happy with my sex life. Okay? So first of all, it has to be a problem. So you not wanting to have sex and not caring if you want to have sex is okay. That's normal. Now, it may cause distress in your marriage or your relationships, but that's you, okay? Now, if it causes you distress, then that's a problem. So let's, let's all be on the same um, playing field, okay? It must cause you distress. If, you're, if it's causing your partner distress and you don't give a fuck, that's okay. Now, you may not be able to stay married, but um, that's the discussion between you and your partner. Sorry, I had to go get my charger. <clears throat> so, so she comes to me and she says, it is causing me distress. There are five buckets of female sexual dysfunction and they can overlap, okay? And not all medications treat the same thing. So you guys may be getting all this, you know, DIM and DHEA and all this shit that is not going to help you. Okay. Um, number one, desire. Number two, arousal. Number three, orgasm. Number four, pain. And number five, relationship disorder. All of these buckets, they can overlap. Okay. So relationship disorder, no medication is going to help you with a relationship disorder at the end. And if your relationship is dependent on your sexual availability, that's a problem, okay? And I can't fix that for you. Number two, number two, desire. Desire is what happens in the brain. Desire is I love my partner, I'm totally used to be down with this, and now that is gone and I'm upset about it, okay? That is a desire disorder in your head. Arousal is what happens in the pelvis, okay? So that is blood flow going to the clitoris it becomes enlarged it 
be then your whole clitoral you know all the clitoral areas become enlarged and engorged and then you have increased mucus production and then it's all in preparation so so a lot of women are like once i get going all that happens and i'm fine so that's not an arousal disorder arousal disorders are treated with things like vaginal viagra can be helpful increases blood flow to the area okay then there is a uh, orgasmic disorder about 10 percent of you have never had an orgasm in your life and it's okay you're not gonna if you're 55 my age you never had an orgasm it's not gonna happen imagine imagine if that happened to 10 percent of men there what do you think would happen i want to see in the comments what do you think would happen if 10 percent of men were in orgasm in no one talks about this there's no treatment there's no research no one imagine it would be a national emergency World War Three, yeah. So there's primary and secondary anorgasmia. There are women who have never orgasmed. There's women who used to, but now can't. That could be a nerve conduction disorder. That could be lots of different things. And that really re requires a sexual medicine specialist to help get to the bottom of it. And it may not be treatable, okay? Um, then there is um, pain. If it hurts, that no one wants to do it. That is, that is a block in your brain. So 53% of you are going to have pain with intercourse in your menopause, and that's usually due to menopause vaginal atrophy, and that is completely treatable with vaginal estrogen, okay? You never want to get to that uh, point. So we must fix the pain before you rush to testosterone or let someone just, if you go in and you say, I'm, having, I'm struggling with my sexual function, and they don't have the conversation I just had with you, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Okay, and they might give you medicine that you don't need, and now you're going to feel worse that your libido is not improved because you had a pain or a relationship disorder or something else. Okay, don't let anyone do that to you. You must fix the pain, you must fix the re relationship, you know, before you go and take all this other stuff. Now, Treatment options. So there is Addy and Vilisi, which are FDA approved for the treatment of hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Desire, pure desire. They don't treat arousal. They don't treat pain. They don't treat anything else. Okay. Then there is testosterone. Addy and Vilisi are not covered by insurance because no one gives a shit about your sexual function when you can basically get Viagra for free. Okay. Addy, you take every day as a pill. Vilisi, you take as an injection 10 minutes before, or no, one hour before. No, I have not had one single patient who has agreed to Vilisi. It's too expensive, and they don't want the pressure of waiting that hour and what's going on there. Okay, Addy, I have a couple patients on Addy. Again, very, very expensive, and the results were modest at best. Modest, one to two more sexual, pleasurable sexual encounters per month. That's it. Testosterone can be helpful, especially in menopause, okay? Now, again, FDA has not approved testosterone for the treatment of women, although we have studies showing that it is helpful, okay? So how do you get it? Some of y'all are being pelleted to male levels. Some of you are being transitioned to males. Your males don't, and it's sad, because you're, all the side effects, all the horrible stuff, the rage, the, you know, but you want to have sex again, and that's all your partners care about. Might need to find a new partner. So, but I do prescribe testosterone. I'm also using it off label for the treatment of sarcopenia, which is low muscle mass. So, this is a complicated subject. And just saying, oh, we need to throw testosterone at you and it's going to fix everything is a fallacy. Okay. So, that is my spiel on that. All right, guys, my husband is making me some lunch and I'm going to jump off. It was awesome to talk to you. I usually prescribe a cream. Uh, in testosterone for my patients. Um, okay. Uh, yes, you can be perimenopause and show normal hormone levels. Absolutely. Abs that is the definition of perimenopause is symptoms with normal one, one time normal hormone levels. Okay. Um, all right, guys, hopefully you learned something. Give me a bunch of likes on your way out. Help me drive this silly algorithm. Go check us out at our link in bio. I have tons of free resources. I have blogs about all of this stuff. We have the Galveston diet. You can go check out our new meals. And, um, and thank you, thank you, thank you for your support.